we are super excited to have you all here. We have three fantastic clinicians lined up for this, um, and we're really excited to talk about the use of COVID, uh, the use of point of care ultrasound when it comes to the care of COVID patients. The inspiration came for this as our friends uh, in the Northeast were starting to wind down, yet epicenters were flaring up across the country in Arizona, Texas, and elsewhere. Um, and also being a little bit of a nerd, I wanted to make sure that I included uh, waves for ultrasound waves, thus the news COVID, um, focus in the care of COVID, managing the waves. So uh, the goal here is we wanted a very brief session, 45 minutes or less to deal with our pandemic uh, attention spans, mine is shot. And we also wanted to tackle care across the spectrum, not just emergency department critical care, but um, tackle a variety of different opinions here. So um, one thing we wanted to talk about here, uh, at the end, we want to answer any questions that you have. And so please feel free to submit those questions and we're gonna um, tackle as many as possible within the 45 minutes. So uh, one thing that we're really proud of is our um, global aspirations. So we are hoping to, we currently have probes in a variety of settings that we'll go into at a different time, uh, but due to our faculty here and their connections, we're really excited to get probes out to both Uganda and Zimbabwe um, in the coming months. So first up, we're gonna have Dr. Srikar Adhikari. Dr. Adhikari is a professor of um, professor with tenure, actually. He's the section chief for ultrasound, and he also is the curriculum director for the University of Arizona School, um, or rather, sorry, College of Medicine. He's a very, very well-known POCUS expert, and he's gonna share a few cases from his emergency department. So with that, I would like to thank you for being here with us this afternoon, and let's go ahead and tackle some emergency medicine cases. Thank you, Renee. Um, it is my pleasure to join you today, uh, this afternoon, uh, and review the lung ultrasound and the assessment of COVID patients. Let me start with a disclaimer. The content I am presenting here today is based on existing literature. I am not promoting any one particular ultrasound device to perform lung ultrasound or use in your clinical practice. Over the last uh, two decades or so, point of care ultrasound, uh, lung ultrasound has gained increasing importance both as a diagnostic and monitoring tool in the acute care settings. The scope of lung ultrasound in emergency department and ICU settings has been extensively studied. Lung ultrasound has become a great addition to the emergency physician's uh, diagnostic armamentarium. Uh, with the recent COVID outbreak and resulting pandemic, I mean, there has been an increasing need for uh, diagnostic tools to safely assess these patients. Um, multiple studies and case reports have been published in the literature uh, looking at the use of uh, lung ultrasound in patients with suspected or confirmed COVID infection. Most of this published uh, literature came from outside the United States. And a variety of lung ultrasound protocols have been explored um, in the past six months. Uh, some are 10 zones, some 12, some 14, um, and a variety of lung ultrasound findings have been described. The lung ultrasound findings are primarily related to the stage of the disease, how severe the lung injury is, and the underlying comorbidities. The predominant pattern of these lung ultrasound findings is of varying degrees of uh, interstitial syndrome and alveolar consolidation and the degree of which is actually correlates with the, how severe the lung injury is. So one of the limitations of lung ultrasound is that it cannot detect lesions that are deep within the lung because air in the lung blocks the transmission of the ultrasound beams. So for the abnormality in the lung abnormality to be visualized well, it must extend to the pleural surface uh, to be visible in the ultrasound. So, what do we see um, um, when we scan COVID patients? Um, the findings are, there are several findings described in the literature which are listed in this slide. Uh, they're more visible in the posterior inferior as, uh, areas of the lung. Um, normal pleura is about 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters uh, thickness. And what has been described uh, as far as COVID ultrasound findings are concerned, there are several pleural abnormalities, either pleura is thick or disrupted, I mean loss of continuity, um, and irregular. Um, besides the pleural um, findings or patterns, um, 
there are a variety of uh, bee lines patterns have all have been described as well. Um, depending on the gap between the bee lines when you're scanning, they're classified as either B7 lines, B3 lines, or diffuse B lines. So essentially B7 lines are caused by interlobular septal thickening under the pleura. Uh, B3 lines, when the distance between them is only uh, three millimeters, that represents more severe uh, alveolar interstitial syndrome. And the diffuse B lines correspond to severe pulmonary edema. So both B3 uh, lines and uh, diffuse B lines go along with the ground glass opacities uh, seen on the CT scan. Besides the B line stuff, um, on occasion, um, you can see pleural effusions and also subpleural consolidations as well. And, you know, they, have, they are sometimes centimeter or more than centimeter. So there are variations to some of these uh, findings. And finally, um, you can see uh, patients who are recovering, uh, you will see the um, airlines back you know, when you scan them. So let's look at uh, a few examples here. On the right side, you see two nice uh, rib shadows, a normal plural line, no B lines, maybe a Z line. Um, but when it comes to on the left side, uh, you are seeing thickened pleura, regular pleura, and even uh, somewhat disrupted pleura with some B lines coming out of the pleura. That is suggest to, uh, that is being described as one of the COVID ultrasound findings. In this example, again, there's thickened pleura, disrupted pleura, but you see more, um, um, diff uh, maybe you can call this a B3 lines or even diffuse B lines here. In this um, clip, not only you are seeing um, um, thickened pleura, but also you're seeing um, some B lines and also some subpleural sub consolidation as well. It's a small one. In this line, actually, the consolidation is much more obvious. It looks like it's about a centimeter. It's hypoechoic area, which is right underneath the pleural line. In this um, clip, you're seeing thickened pleura, disrupted pleura, and also you're seeing uh, air bronchogram, which is also described um, with the uh, COVID ultrasound findings. And this one is just thickened pleura, multiple multifocal B lines uh, coming out, um, one of the other variations of COVID ultrasound findings. And finally here, you have the conplura, you have irregular pleura, but more uh, coalesced uh, B lines compared to the previous example. And here, this is a patient who's recovering from COVID. You're not seeing any B lines, but you're seeing A lines here. So um, we, we, tons of literature has been published to date. Uh, manuscripts have been published uh, with regard to COVID and use of lung ultrasound. Um, these uh, manuscripts have highlighted the use of uh, lung ultrasound for triage or disposition of COVID patients, in some cases prognostication, uh, and then COVID and lung ultrasound has also been used for monitoring patients who have been uh, admitted into the hospital particularly in some cases where management of the ventilator and also assessing the uh, effects of therapeutic interventions. Um, there are a few uh, studies looked and they looked at home monitoring uh, using um, lung ultrasound and also um, if they could make any recommendations uh, for isolation. Uh, and that finally, uh, in the pediatric and OB population, uh, how can we use um, long ultrasound if uh, so in suspected or confirmed uh, COVID patients. There are a uh, few manuscripts published uh, exploring uh, that aspect as well. So like I mentioned earlier, there are all limitations to using long ultrasound in COVID patients. The findings are not very specific to um, COVID-19. The same similar findings, you can find them in people who have viral or bacterial pneumonias. However, if you don't see these findings, I think it would help to make that alternate uh, diagnosis. So 
even though a lot has been published to date, um, we have to be careful how we interpret COVID long ultrasound literature. A majority are case reports, case series, and small observational studies. That is something I take into consideration when I'm using ultrasound in my clinical practice. So in my opinion, long ultrasound is helpful with risk stratification of suspected or confirmed COVID patients. There are a few studies um, that have been published to date actually looked at long ultrasound scores and integrating these long ultrasound scores into clinical decision algorithms, taking into consideration other patient factors such as comorbid illnesses, oxygen saturation, a need for oxygen, and so on. Essentially, what they have done is they scanned different uh, zones and they looked at the presence of A lines, B lines, pleural patterns, and in subpleural consolidation height, whether it's a centimeter or less than centimeter or whatnot. So each, for each zone, the clinician gave a number and finally they came up with the cumulative score. And if it is more than 16, uh, so they've used it different for disposition, taking into consideration other factors, like I mentioned, oxygen saturation, need for oxygen. I just want to mention one study which I came across. This was done in Israel, and this is really a step in the right direction. This study actually looked at association of long ultrasound findings with mortality. So it's, again, it's a small study. There are 120 patients. They, what they found is three things. One is presence of pleural effusion, pleural thickening, high, and high total lung ultrasound score, more than 18 at baseline exam, they found they were significantly associated with increased mortality and also associated with the need for ventilation. I think this information is extremely helpful and I find risk stratification using lung ultrasound um, is the way to go. Um, and I think we need more of this literature at this point. So let me show you a couple of examples here, our cases here. This is a 46-year-old gentleman who comes in with symptoms of cough and fever. Um, he gives history of exposure to COVID. He doesn't have any comorbid illnesses. He's febrile, he's tachypneic. His pulse ox was 93%. His um, chest x-ray did not reveal any significant abnormalities. And we did an ambulatory pulse ox, which was not consistently low, however, it did dip down to like 90%. And, the, um, uh, and then it was, you have to make a decision at that point based on algorithms, uh, this gentleman can probably go home. And, but the cases I've seen something similar have bounced back. So that's the reason we did a point of care ultrasound um, in this patient. And here actually you can see not only subpleural consolidation, but also very coalesced like B lines. Based on these findings, we actually ended up admitting this patient, which turned out to be a good decision uh, based on the complicated hospital course he had. Let's look at a different case. This is a 65-year-old male, history of COPD. He presents with cough and fever, also gives history of uh, exposure to COVID, and it's febrile, he's tachypneic, he's hypoxic to 90%. So, and again, his chest x-ray did not show anything exciting besides regular COPD stuff. So by textbook with his underlying comorbid illnesses, we should be admitting this patient. But we really don't know what his normal O2 level is and we didn't have anything to compare. So we did a lung ultrasound on him. We did not find anything significant. We just found maybe a thick and flora and and disrupted pleura. With these findings, we felt comfortable discharging this job. And again, this is a COVID uh, surge at uh, peak time. So we really don't want to admit patients. We want to conserve beds. And also, we probably don't do any justice admitting these patients. You know, he may get a hospital-acquired infection and whatnot. So we decided to discharge based on these findings, and he did well. So uh, even though I said most of the literature came out from outside the United States, um, we still, I think there's a place for uh, lung ultrasound in our, in our developed countries like us, uh, because when the systems are overwhelmed by COVID, when there are limited resources, I think still COVID uh, lung ultrasound is useful to limit some of the chest x ray use and, and reduce the exposure of healthcare providers. So, to summarize, I think um, lung ultrasound is good for um, risk stratification and it will help define the extent of the disease. And in some cases, it will help to make alternate diagnosis as well. Thank you.
Okay, well, thank you, Shrikarth, so much for those cases. Something as an internist that I really love is to talk about uh, clinical decision making and what pushes you one way or the other. So um, we're going to move ahead in the hospital course, and it's my honor to introduce Dr. Argavan Salles. Um, Dr. Salles is a very well-known surgeon, speaker, and scholar. She's also one of the founding members of Times Up Healthcare, which is hugely important important to me, so I'm really excited to have her here with us. Um, when I, uh, we had a really excellent hospital medicine focus expert lined up and the timing didn't work out. And I thought to myself, she had just been over in Arizona taking care of her second round of volunteer patients with COVID in the ICUs. And I thought, you know, I don't want to be preaching to the choir. There's all these clinicians out there in the world and in the U.S. who don't know what POCUS can do. And so I figured, let's get the most authentic person to talk about the care of POCUS patients, how it can be limited, and then expand upon some of the additional uses. So thankfully, she was willing. Um, so again, really excited to have somebody who hasn't chugged the POCUS Kool-Aid like myself to, to talk a little bit about her experiences. And then um, just a couple, we'll go through a couple slides on other use cases. So off to you, Dr. Salas. Thanks so much for having me and for the kind introduction. So um, I am a general surgeon trained in surgery. I'm not a critical care um, specialist, but I spent a couple of weeks in New York and then a few weeks in Arizona um, taking care of patients who have COVID and are in intensive care um, or requiring intensive care. I think there's a couple of, um, so Dr. Twerstall had asked me, you know, what my experience had been and, um, you know, was there any role that I could see for POCUS um, in those settings? And I said, absolutely, because of two different things. So one, um, there are times when there just aren't enough resources. So when I was in New York, um, basically it was very hard to get x-rays, like just basic plain x-rays. Um, I had my very first night there in the ICU, I had put in a chest tube for a patient um, just at the end of my shift. So probably around 6 a.m., and then when I came in that night, I just wanted to check the x-ray that was um, obtained after the tube was put in because it hadn't been done by the time I left around 730. And that x-ray didn't get done until about noon. Um, and that's just because there's such limited resources. So people were not getting daily chest x-rays or even every other chest x-rays or anything like that. So when we would um, put in a central line, for example, there wasn't really a quick way to get an x-ray because there just weren't enough techs and there weren't enough machines. Um, or if a patient had a sudden decom decompensation and you wanted to know, for example, if they were just intubated, was their ET tube in the right main stem or did they have a pneumothorax or, you know, any of these types of things. It was very difficult um, to assess without using something that's more immediate. So one is when there are lack of resources and you can't get to the x-ray tech or you can't get an x-ray machine, um, I could see that as being a way to use... Um, ultrasound and then, or a, a reason to use ultrasound. And the other is even if you have, so when I was in Arizona, I felt like there were more resources available. The system was not quite as overwhelmed. And yet it's still more efficient in a lot of cases to use something like ultrasound. So if you're a uh, point of care ultrasound. So if you're um, thinking about a patient who's not doing well, um, let's say they ha they're hypotensive. Yeah, you could like get an echocardiogram, for example, or you could do CVP monitoring, or you could, I mean, there's a thousand things you could do. Well, a lot of times the easiest thing might be just putting a probe on their IVC and, and seeing how that looks or, or looking at their heart. Is there, um, do they have effective squeeze of their um, cardiac myocytes? So those are the two different scenarios that I immediately thought of. One is when you can't get an x-ray. Um, and then the other is just if you want to expedite patient care and not have to wait for say someone to come to do an echocardiogram or um, some other test to help you understand what's happening with your patient, then you could use a point of care ultrasound. For sure. And that's so um, when we get to our, our next amazing speaker, she's going to talk to us more about cardiac ultrasound. Um, and I think out in Oregon, we've been incredibly fortunate. We've not had uh, a, a great number of COVID patients, at least at the university hospital. And so um, I just kind of wanted to hear from somebody who'd been there, done that, uh, kind of the, the a special value that, that you thought it could have. And I remember another um, friend of ours, Dr. Mark Shapiro had texted me saying, um, he's on the COVID ward down in California. And he said, 
Polka should be mandatory. I can't hear a thing over this cap bar, like literally not a thing, which to us internists, I mean, that's like baby. I still, I'm sorry, people, I still carry it around with me. So um, all these scenarios where you feel like you're just literally flying blind is what people have shared with me. So um, with that, we're gonna go ahead and I'll just show a couple of quick clips. Um, so we'll pull up um, the slides here with me. And so this is an example. So we mentioned not being able to confirm central line placement. So uh, there were some different studies previously where you use fancy things like contrast or agitated saline, but more recently, just five cc's of, of normal saline just flushed to help confirm. And again, this is just a normal cardiac view. This study, they actually, um, not this study from this, this GIF, but uh, in the study, they looked at it could be any cardiac view, parasternal, apical, subxiphoid, and so kind of a quick and dirty way to confirm your chest X-ray when you either don't have access to it, or it would take forever and more, you know, more PPE for another person to go in, um, or a long time to get it confirmed. Here's another example here. So again, we see these little bubbles. I, I like to say to my students. Uh, air is the enemy of ultrasound. And so uh, we have our, our little bubbles floating through here from the saline. And so we can tell immediately after we flush that this is actually within the, the SVC. Um, so then the other thing I wanted to highlight here, so you can see here the POCUS Atlas is on both of these. And so I believe um, as I'm giving my lectures, whether to students, uh, anybody, uh, I love um, actually showing where I find things and how they can get their own things later. So the POCUS Atlas is one of my absolute favorite resources. And you can look up on there the Evidence Atlas as well. So um, they're not affiliated with BAVE in any way, shape, or form, but I believe in giving credit where credit is due. And so I pulled these off of there on purpose to promo. So check it out. Um, okay, and then lung sliding. Um, another thing Dr. Salas had mentioned is, you know, these patients, you have... They're, they're going downhill, and one of the only things you could actually do to, to help is if they had popped a pneumothorax, you know, you could do a chest tube, like she was saying. So this, these are just some examples of lung sliding. So it's pretty easy to see. They call it, like, you know, ants marching or shimmering or whatever. So high-frequency linear pro probe over here on the left, and then on the right, um, this is um, the VAVE in uh, the lung preset. So um, just kind of quick and dirty, look for lung sliding, move along. Okay, and then these here, just to show you how easy it is to tell the difference, of course, uh, you're seeing this, uh, we're projecting live, so maybe it's actually not easy to see on your computer, but in real life, here we can see that this plural line is static and it's not moving at all. It's moving a tiny bit up and down, but that's only because a patient is trying to breathe and there's a little bit of musculature effort. Here, right next to it, we can see this nice little shimmering. So again, these are just a couple of, of kind of quick and easy ways to, um, I shouldn't say, I should stop saying easy, uh, quick and simple once you've done a little training, which um, is another passion project of mine. Um, so at this point in time, um, Yep, that's what I wanted to cover there. So now we're gonna bring up and we're gonna kick it on to our next speaker. We're gonna move ahead within the hospitalization. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Bebel. So um, Dr. Buell, she is a uh, trained in infectious diseases and critical care. Her practice is in intent, um, critical care at Massachusetts General Hospital. She's also an instructor of medicine with Harvard uh, Medical School. And then she does a great amount of research, global research and POCUS teaching in places like Uganda. So I'm um, super excited to have you here, Dr. Bevel, to share with us some of your cases from when Boston was in its peak. Thanks so very much, Renee, for the introductory. Excited to be here with you. some of my experience in the intensive care unit COVID surge. So today, things that I'd like to cover, we talk about the role for COVID for cardiac and then we'll talk about cases. I'll take you that I participated in. Sounds like you're not here. See if I can take on my again. How about that? 
hopefully with good sound. Okay about that. So just as having me here today, a bit about my experience with COVID. So we still have quite a few cases behind us. So, um, let me just see if you're hearing me well. Now, connect the AirPods. So let's see if I can do that again. All right, I'm just let me know if you can hear me. Hey everybody. So, you know, we had a debate while this was going, uh, while we were, we were planning for this, we were like, okay, do we record in advance and we make sure uh, timing is perfect, sound is perfect after the last sound debacle. And we just thought, you know, I mean, first of all, I'm in the hospital in the wards. Like if anything's going to be authentic, it's going to be me sitting here in a workroom with a bunch of nerdy um, drawings in the background. But honestly, stuff happens with tech, Wi-Fi, uh, organs full of smoke. So we decided we would try to be authentic and go live. And um, yes, I also can answer questions. So, okay, I'm gonna keep rocking with some questions and we're gonna get Dr. Bebel on maybe with her phone for the little face port. Um, so somebody had asked, do you use ultrasound guidance for all line placements? Uh, I believe that that is a matter of, and we can kick this when we're all doing questions at the end, we'll include Shrikar. Um, but, I would say it's definitely the standard of care. That being said, my hospitalist friends in New York, um, in Boston during the surges said, um, you know, this is like military medicine. You know, you can't, you can't, if you don't have ultrasound there, you can't do it. Sometimes you have to drop a line anyway. Um, but I would say it's definitely um, the standard of care. Same for the other procedures, Thora, Para nowadays, even for us poor, you know, uh, people, people sometimes think that internal medicine is behind on our ultrasound guided procedures, but even for internists, it's absolutely um, the standard of care, I would say. So, all right, we got any other ones? Okay, um, someone said, I've been using POCUS, but not lung yet. How can we get started? Good resources for lung scanning, COVID, or even a virtual course. So um, on Saturday, this Saturday and Sunday, um, AIUM, American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, is doing a, um, a virtual course where it'll be lectures and then proctored hands-on scanning virtually and then some case studies. And so that's something that VAVE is supporting um, so Vave is supporting that. So that'll be one thing. Um, I think there's still spaces for that. Also, um, I know American College of Emergency Physicians is adding in more, um, also American uh, College of Physicians. And so we've brought everybody up live. And actually this is a perfect time to see, Lisa, if you speak on your phone, how does it sound now? This will be our test. You might be muted, so tap mute. And then while she's doing that, Shrikar, you can talk about in emergency medicine, 
ultrasound guidance of procedures. Give us your thoughts there. Even Absolutely. The there is no, yeah. there won't be any line placed in our emergency department. Never, I don't believe, yeah. except, except cardiac arrest is the only time I think somebody might put a femoral line or something like that without using ultrasound guidance. It's period. All central lines, all procedures are done on ultrasound guidance. Yeah. Totally get it. Um, and let's see here. So we're getting hooked up there. Um, the other one, Shrikar, do you have any? Yeah, courses, so virtual courses. So uh, certainly you can go to a course, but I think there are so many free resources out there. Just type in YouTube. Yeah. There are tons of free resources out there. Tom, like uh, lung ultrasound. I think Sauna Guide is going to come out from ASAP, which is also going to be a free resource. Uh, SAEM has free a lot of uh, free resources mm -hmm. as well. There, I, I I personally don't believe like you have to spend money to learn a lot of ultrasound these days. There are so many free resources out there. If we can just look um, uh, ultrasound of the week and so on, there, there are a lot of things you can learn um, just from free resources itself. Yeah, ultrasound of the week, ultrasound podcast, five minutes sono. Um, I also, I already pitched uh, the POCUS Atlas. And finally, um, before we cut back to have Lisa try one more time, um, the, uh, again, we mentioned if you registered for this webinar, uh, you can you'll be you'll get a, an email from us and you can submit 25 images for experts to review and give you feedback on and so teaching these big internal medicine courses i often heard i can go practice but no one gives me feedback and i don't know if i'm doing a good enough job and so that's something that we're trying to to step in and, and help fill that void so um yes if you register for the webinar you'll get an email to be able to submit your images and we're working on more educational content as well. So, okay, Dr. Buell, let's give it another try. And I should say, just so everybody doesn't think I'm a slacker, we totally tried this beforehand. It was literally working like right when we started. So, um, you know, just, just happened. So, all right, let's see if we can hear you now. All right, let's give it a try. Can you hear me? <laughs> Awesome. All right. <laughs> so hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Babel. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and for having me. I'll be talking a little faster than I normally would. I'll be sharing a bit about my experience working with patients with COVID in our ICUs here in Boston over the last several months. Next slide, please. They're pulling up the slides. I'll just tell you a little bit about the outline that we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of POCUS, cardiac POCUS specifically, in patients who have COVID. We'll go through four cardiac cases, and then we'll go through how we use POCUS during the surge in our hospitals. Next slide, please. All right, so firstly, um, what is the role of, of cardiac POCUS in this outbreak? So you can actually use it in almost any patient, whether or not they're confirmed to have COVID. It's actually a very helpful tool for determining the cause of shock. So some patients with COVID will have shock. Um, most of the time, it's not directly from COVID, but it can be, and we'll show you some cases where there is cardiac involvement. So as an undifferentiated cause of, um, as a way to differentiate the cause of shock, it can be quite helpful. So I highly recommend using it in patients who are both confirmed and suspected. Sometimes there's a delay in getting your results, so it's hard to know who is confirmed and who is suspected of having COVID. So it can be really quite helpful. Um, we use it also to look at the right heart and especially to understand whether or not there's a risk of PE. So right heart strain can give you some evidence of uh, PE in certain cases. So we use it in that as well and also for volume assessment to decide whom we should volume resuscitate and how and how much volume to give. So I'd like to take you through four brief cases if we can get those cases up. I'm not seeing them show yet. So I'll start talking about case one and hopefully we can pull that one up. So the first case I'll tell you about was a patient that we worked with who was 53 years old, had COPD, mild obesity, smoking history, and presented to an outside hospital with four days of dyspnea and chest pressure. Um, O2 sat when we saw the patient, or sorry, when the patient first presented was 82% on room air. Patient unfortunately had escalating O2 needs, was intubated, was prone, treated with inhaled epoprostenol, and also given cerulamab and hydroxychloroquine, some off-label treatments. Eventually, this patient was transferred and cannulated for VV ECMO at our hospital. So if we can get the first clip to play on the left, 
This will show you what the heart looked like for this patient. And in this scenario, you can see actually that both ventricles are actually working quite hard and there's good squeeze from both ventricles. You see a very nice concentric and um, coordinated motion by the heart. So that gives you a sense that there's really good cardiac function, very helpful in this patient to know that their um, heart is functioning well. Also, um, on the right-hand clip, if that one will play eventually, this is more just a fun clip to show when you have a patient with ECMO, sometimes you can actually see the catheter. And so this is a clip on the right of um, the ECMO catheter that is extending from the IVC into the RA. The second case was an 87-year-old gentleman who had hypertension, a remote history of provoked DVT, and a remote colon cancer history who was admitted with a week of cough and fever. He was intubated a day after presentation for worsening altered mental status, increased work of breathing, and unfortunately developed two pressor shock requiring both norepinephrine and epinephrine. So pretty impressive shock and elevated cardiac biomarkers. So this is one of those cases like I was talking about earlier, where we're interested in using POCUS to help determine and differentiate the cause of shock, whether it be septic from cardiac. So next slide, we can actually play this clip. And here in this clip, you can actually see the left ventricle in cross section. And at the apex of left ventricle, you actually see um, a ballooning. And this is a curvature that's not normal for the left ventricle. And this is actually an example of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, which was named after the Japanese octopus trap. And it's an example of stress cardiomyopathy that happened in this gentleman. So our third case is a 60-year-old woman. She had transformed B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma and was undergoing chemotherapy treatment for that diagnosis. She'd also been diagnosed with COVID-19 a few days prior. She, imp she improved somewhat to the point where she was actually discharged from the hospital and then was unfortunately readmitted with neutropenic fever and was intubated five days after her readmission. So this is one of those examples of a more prolonged COVID course of COVID, where the patient then worsened later, required intubation. So unfortunately, she also developed shock and atrial tachycardia. And we use POCUS in this setting to help understand what was happening in the heart, what was the cause of shock, and perhaps why she was having tachycardia. So in the image here that you can see from her, this one, you see that the heart is very discoordinated and all four chambers seem to be moving somewhat independently and not functioning particularly well. So the left ventricle, which is at the bottom part of the screen, and the right ventricle at the top part of the screen seem not to be having very good squeeze. And both of the atria don't seem to be well coordinated with ventricles. So in this case, we would call this diffuse myocarditis. And this has been shown um, in some cases to be directly related to the virus SARS-CoV-2. Next um, slide, please. So for the fourth and last case, I'll tell you about a 53-year-old man who was previously treated for latent TB. He developed a dry cough. He tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, and he was admitted eight days later with respiratory distress and a room air O2 sat of 70%. He was also intubated, developed tachycardia and positive cardiac biomarkers with a very high D-dimer. So in this case, next slide, please, we were interested in looking at the right heart specifically to try to understand better whether he was at high risk for pulmonary embolism and if we should treat empirically or get confirmatory testing with a CAT scan. So in this clip, you can actually see the right ventricle on the left side of the screen um, and the right ventricle, sorry, the right ventricle on the left side of the screen, the left ventricle on the right side of the screen. The LV here, the left ventricle, is much smaller than the RV. So the RV is dilated, and there's some evidence of McConnell sign here where the right ventricular free wall is really not moving well, but the apex of the heart is squeezing well. So that's the last case. So let me just summarize how we use POCUS at our hospitals. Um, actually, first, I'll tell you that uh, people who have cardiac injury with COVID definitely have a worse prognosis, so there can be some prognostic value. And unfortunately, three of these four patients did die from COVID. So um, lastly, just to say how we use POCUS in our hospitals, it varied a little from hospital to hospital. I worked at um, all three, partners, three of our partners' hospitals during that time. Mass General, the Brigham, and the Newton Wellesley, and each had a slightly different protocol. So firstly, we would go in with the machine ourselves if we were gonna examine the patient. 
only trained providers would acquire the images, and we would do it fairly rapidly using limited views, and this allowed us to conserve uh, personal protective equipment and also not to expose additional people, for example, ultrasound techs, to the virus if it wasn't necessary. So it both helps save time and PPE and limit exposure. So we would acquire the images and then we would document a procedure note in our medical record. And then the procedure following that was a little different at each hospital, but those images would be overread either by another more expert internal medicine physician who was uh, very familiar with ultrasound or an echocardiographer or radiologist, depending on what the need was and what type of scan it was. So that didn't happen in real time. Those results were, were available fairly soon. So the advantages for us were conserving PPE and limited exposure and also having some real-time feedback, like the example I mentioned about PE, that allowed us to then change our therapy immediately if necessary. The disadvantage is that are some people had very difficult windows and we weren't always able to obtain great images, especially with people who are less expert users of point-of-care ultrasound. And also, um, we weren't always able to get real-time feedback on what those images meant. So for less expert users, it was a little bit more challenging, and we weren't always able to interpret and make changes in care. So finally, I'll just say thank you for having me today and looking forward to participating in question session if we have any additional time. Thanks. So we've had some questions come in. First of all, Dr. Saleh asked an awesome question of her own based on her MICU time, which is, um, what do you do with prone patients and how are you gonna ultrasound them? So I figured that's a great question for Dr. Babel. So, and now she is muted again, I swear. Y'all, I'm never doing this when I'm on the wards again. I thought it would like timing wise be okay, but no, never again. There was another question, and I believe our friendly assistant, Shantanu, is going to be typing more here in our chat box. So there's another question about where in Tanzania, and there's actually two different places we're in discussions with. One is where the University of California Irvine students always go and do their teaching. Um, another one is with a, a German doctor has an, um, a non-for-profit. So I didn't want to go into all of the, the weeds about that there, but it, we're actually very interested in global partnerships and would love for you to reach out to us with any suggestions. And I got so excited for questions, I forgot to thank Dr. Babel for her cases, her excellent cases, and saying that you get the trophy of the day for dealing with the um, audio issues and then me not hearing you and then interrupting you anyway. So perfect, very, very strong work. So um, another question came in saying, any recs for new learners with how to get started with POCUS? Um, I'm gonna give my take on it and then kick it off to you all. Uh, just practice, practice, practice. You can't hurt anybody with a probe. You can hurt someone by making decisions that you don't know anything about, but just practicing every chest X-ray, CT scan, ultrasound, get your hands on a probe and do it yourself and see what you can find. And then go look at that gold standard. And then you're immediately getting feedback. And that's what I did when I didn't, I only got procedures and residency and everything else I learned afterwards. So on to you all. I'll give my take. Um, I think we've already talked about free resources and whatnot. Certainly you need to have some knowledge uh, and learn a little bit of technique. But I think the key is, that in, my, in my opinion, there are two things. One is you need to have a device. And that part, I think, is a lot easier now than during my fellowship days in 2005 because you can buy a device, a handheld device of some sort. That's number one. Because now you you got to be able to scan every day. That's that's the only way you're going to get better and, and you know, improve on your skill, your skills. And the second is actually some sort of proctoring, right? So um, most of the people take courses, they don't have the device, they never scan. And even if they scan, there's nobody's giving them feedback. So I think those are the two key items for you to, uh, for somebody to get better, uh, learn a new technique and get better. How about either of you two, or we do have another 
question for Dr. Babel as well about, um, so any thoughts and then I'll read this question to you. And Dr. Salas, when you were back uh, there, was it just kind of see one, do one, teach one when you were, you know, doing the, the long sliding and stuff in New York? Just curious. Yeah, I mean, I think it was mostly just whoever was around and wherever. I mean, one other issue that I didn't mention is um, like in New York, there was really one ultrasound that was for a couple of different ICUs. So tracking down yeah. the ultrasound was its own separate issue. Um, whereas in Arizona, the team had purchased, you know, um, one like that functions with a tablet, whereas the other one was like, a, I think it was a spark. So anyway, like finding the ultrasound can be a challenge. Um, and then whoever has it and brings it over and has the skill to use it, will just use it. So it was very much a team effort, I would say on all of that. Totally. So I will show you, I would be remiss if I didn't on a vague website say uh, the benefit of some of the smaller ones. Wait, let me get it up high enough. Let me see. There we go. Um, is that there's so these can be completely specifically, of course, our lovely device. Um, it's it's you can high level disinfect it. You can just dunk it in Cydex. Um, and so you can have it in a separate container. So your you can have your pro cover and then your phone cover and never have to have the cord not worry about the nooks and crannies of the cart based machine um, and cast it from this outside the room, even as long, you know, within 10, 15 feet, you can cast the image to other phones, either Android or iOS. So those are a couple of things. Um, and then just the price points is, is Dr. Adhikari mentioned the price points have fallen so much. And so, um, yeah, so that's uh, our, our take on it. Um, so for Massachusetts General, um, what proportion of the physicians, or not specific to Massachusetts General Hospital, but when you were working in your ICUs, Dr. Babel, what proportion of physicians were trained and able to use the ultrasound? Growing numbers and procedures are what we can. Procedures are like the the gateway drug for POCUS. You know, it's like uh, if you could do procedures and then you start looking at your plural effusion, like, oh, that's kind of cool. And so, you know, getting those and working into the diagnostic stuff is excellent. Um, so we can hear her response, but apparently it wasn't audible on the live stream. So basically, um, I'm going to go cry myself to sleep on my huge pillow. No, I'm just. Um, uh, so she just said, you know, maybe a third, everybody's good with procedures, but we're working on the rest of it. So, all right, what other questions do we have? I'm taking the liberty of going seven minutes over given the other, uh, other slight hiccups. And if there are no other questions, I just want to remind people, we'll see if anything else pops up. Um, but so if you register for this, you'll get an email saying where to submit your um, images. Of course, they have to be de-identified and we're working on doing it via the app later. But, you know, right now we'll, we'll send you information. Um, and again, uh, thanks to our speakers, because with their input and, and time, we're going to be, again, um, donating one to two. So whether it's donation loan, I'm still figuring all this out as I do my Sunshine Act and other training. It's Excellent, but we're going to be placing two probes, one in Uganda and one in Zimbabwe, which is very exciting. So thank you for those ideas and into your time. Anyone else? Nope. 
Looks like it's crickets out there. I went over their attention span. So thanks for tuning in. And on October 15th, we're going to be ending with um, a uh, another EduCast. My brain power has been fully used up. So this one is going to be all about teaching. And so we're going to have um, the Oregon Health and Science University educational sonographers going to talk about how we took our in-person clinical ultrasound elective and made it virtual and asynchronous. We're also going to have um, Jacob Avila. Dr. Jacob Avila is going to talk about his work with asynchronous virtual education. And then Dr. Rob Ferry is going to talk about uh, Indiana University. They have a gigantic medical school class and how he's been adopting within a point of care, um, point of care ultrasound education within the world of COVID um, to try to get the trained students with distancing and numbers and other things. So we're going to be talking about how all these excellent teachers have tried to modify their POCUS education for the new normal. Speaking of the new normal, it is smoky in Portland and I am gonna go back and check in with my resident and see some more patients. So everyone have a great afternoon and we'll hope to see you next month.